Can you become infected with SARS-CoV-2 twice? Hi, and welcome to Microbial Minutes. This is the American Society for Microbiology's update on what's hot in the microbial sciences. I'm Ashley Hagan, Science Communication Specialist at ASM, and today we're going to be discussing the risk of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection. Now, since the novel coronavirus emerged in late 2019, scientists have been discussing the possibility of long-term immunity to the virus. Whether or not someone can become infected with SARS-CoV-2 more than once is of great importance, because if protective immunity is naturally produced, we have a greater chance of fighting and preventing the disease through adaptive immune responses and vaccination. But the thing about long-term immunity is that it takes time to develop. And in order to determine whether SARS-CoV-2 reinfection is possible, enough patients had to test positive, fully recover from, and be re-exposed to the virus. In the last couple of weeks, nearly eight months after the first reported U.S. case of COVID-19, a number of reports and papers have been published on this topic. And today we're going to take a look at a few of them. The first paper we're discussing today is a study from the Journal of Clinical Microbiology that demonstrated a correlation between neutralizing antibodies and protection from SARS-CoV-2 amongst a group of 122 people on a fishing vessel that experienced a significant COVID-19 outbreak. What's unique about the setup of this study is that thanks to pre-departure screening, RT-PCR and serology data were available for a majority of the crew members both before and after the outbreak occurred. Because of this, researchers were able to make interpretations about immunity and reinfection that would otherwise not have been possible. There were 122 people, 113 men and nine women on the ship's manifest, and pre-departure data was collected for 120 of them. Before the boat left the harbor, crew members were tested for active COVID-19 via RT-PCR and for evidence of past or ongoing infection via serology testing. Screening took place on days zero and one of the excursion, as you can see here. Initially, zero crew members tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 via RT-PCR, and six had SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, meaning they tested positive via serology testing. The ship departed on day two, but it was forced to return to shore on day 18 because a crew member became ill, then tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 and required hospitalization. Within the next couple of weeks, 101 crew members tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 via RT-PCR or seroconversion during the follow-up period, and 21 crew members tested negative. Cycle threshold values were used to determine positive and negative PCR results. Cycle threshold is a measurement of the number of PCR cycles required to produce a detectable quantity of viral amplicon. Each PCR cycle doubles the quantity of genetic material that was in the previous cycle. So that means CT values are inversely proportional to the amount of viral RNA present in the original sample, and a low CT value indicates a high viral load. In this study, samples were considered positive for SARS-CoV-2 when the CT value was less than 35 cycles. Additionally, and this is the crux of the study, when the fishing vessel returned ashore, the residual pre-departure sera from the six crew members who were initially seropositive before the ship left port were tested for neutralizing and spike binding activity. Three of those showed neutralizing activity against pseudotyped SARS-CoV-2 spike particles. Importantly, none of the people who had neutralizing antibodies prior to departure were infected in the subsequent outbreak, meaning they did not measure positive by RT-PCR, they did not exhibit subsequent seroconversion, and they did not report any symptoms of COVID-19 upon return to shore. The overall rate of infection among individuals with neutralizing antibodies was zero of three while the rate of infection among individuals without neutralizing antibodies was 103 of 117. With an overall attack rate greater than 85%, researchers determined this difference to be statistically significant. And these results provided the first direct evidence that anti-SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies are protective against SARS-CoV-2 infection in humans. So this paper was posted on August 21st, 2020. But on the next slide, you'll see that a little over a week later, reports of the first cases of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection began to emerge. On August 24th, the first reported case of confirmed reinfection came out of Hong Kong. 
A 33-year-old male who was first infected with SARS-CoV-2 in late March tested positive for the virus a second time, nearly four and a half months later. The genetic sequence of the viruses responsible for these two infections differed by 24 nucleotides, indicating that these were indeed two independent cases of infection. Interestingly, the patient exhibited milder symptoms of COVID-19 the second time around, which suggested that he had developed some level of immunity, even if he was unable to fight the virus off completely. Less than a week later, the first confirmed U.S. case of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection emerged. This patient, a 25-year-old male from Nevada, tested positive for COVID-19 in mid-April and was diagnosed for the second time in May. Again, the genetic sequences of the two infections differed from one another, but this time the patient's symptoms were more severe during the second infection, and he ended up hospitalized with pneumonia. Additional cases of reinfection have begun to be reported in Belgium and the Netherlands. So what's going on? Can you get SARS-CoV-2 twice? We now know the answer to that question is yes, but we also know that neutralizing antibodies are correlated with protection from SARS-CoV-2 infection. At first, these may seem like contradictory statements, but in reality, neither of these things is that surprising. When reinfection occurs, it may be for reasons that have to do with the immune system of the host or for reasons that have to do with the evolution and biology of the virus. On the next slide, let's consider the behavior of a couple of other viruses that we're more familiar with. Take chickenpox, for example. For the most part, we expect that contracting chickenpox is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But some people actually get chickenpox twice. When reinfection does occur, it's often in individuals who caught varicella zoster for the first time at a young age, often before six months of age. In such cases, the reason for reinfection later in life is most likely that immunological memory to varicella zoster-specific antigens has waned over time. Similar reasoning drives recommendations for booster shots for pathogens like tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, and pertussis. Influenza virus is another example of a virus that humans may contract multiple times in a lifetime. However, reinfection with the flu is typically due to the frequent antigenic shift and drift that the influenza virus experiences. If an abrupt major change or small changes to the surface proteins of the virus accumulate, our bodies are unable to recognize and neutralize the newer influenza virus and we become susceptible to the flu again. So if we know that even though SARS-CoV-2 reinfection is possible, neutralizing antibodies are correlated with protection against future infection, the logical next question becomes how likely is reinfection to occur? It's important to address the fact that while significant, the above data set is small, and the reports of reinfection have been isolated and sporadic, especially when taking into consideration the total number of COVID-19 cases that have been reported to date. In other words, in order to assess the risk of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection, we simply need more data. On the next slide, we'll briefly look at a preprint of a larger study that has begun to answer this question. The study evaluated 133,266 laboratory-confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 and found that 243 of them, or 0.18%, had at least one subsequent positive swab 45 days after the first positive swab was taken. 22.2% of those had good or strong evidence of reinfection, although most of the cases were mild. One hospitalization and zero deaths were recorded. The study estimated the risk of reinfection to therefore be about 0.04% and the incidence rate of reinfection to be 1.09 per 10,000 person weeks with a 95% confidence interval of 0.84 to 1.42. Based on this data, researchers concluded that SARS-CoV-2 reinfection appears to be a rare phenomenon and protective immunity against reinfection appears to be relatively strong, at least for a few months post-primary infection. So that's the latest, but new data is emerging daily, so check back here regularly for the latest updates, and don't forget to subscribe so you can catch all of our future Microbial Minutes. If you have questions, let us know in the comments section. I'm Ashley Hagen. I'd like to thank you for watching, and thank Ray Ortega for production. I'll talk to you next time.